morning. Uh, welcome to Christchurch. If you're online, you're really welcome this morning. Um, it's a lovely day, isn't it? All bright and crisp and lovely. Um, this week has been a difficult week, hasn't it? Um, just nationally and for anyone who's parents, who are parents, it has been a week of great distress. They are now all at home constantly, never, ever leaving. But um, we are just really grateful to know God in this time. In John 16, 33, Jesus promises us this. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. And I think we can all agree that that is definitely true. But Jesus tells us to take heart because he has overcome the world. And as we come to worship this morning, you would, we're not denying that things are difficult, that there's trouble, that there's illness, there's sadness, there's confusion. When you look at the news, you can see all around the world that the level of people suffering is very, very high at the moment. But we acknowledge that, but we remind our hearts that our God has overcome. He's the one who's overcome sickness, he's overcome death, and that we have the great joy of being able to approach him and worship. So let's worship this morning. Obviously, if you're in the building, you're not allowed to um, sing. You may hum under your mask. But let's approach God with joy, knowing that actually he has overcome the world. Open 
nothing here is hidden you are our one desire you alone are holy only you are worthy god let your fire fall down Down before him, oh 
Lord Jesus, we just say we adore you. Lord God, we're just so amazed that you would love us enough, Lord God, not just to give up on this sin-ridden world, Lord God, but to come down and live amongst us. Lord God, live with all the mess and all the sin around you, you the Holy One, the Perfect One, and that you would go to the cross to die, to save us, to make us acceptable in your sight, to make a way for us to know you, to make a way for us to spend eternity with you, Lord God, to know that there's no sting in death for those who are in Christ Jesus, to know that our lives are in your hands. Lord, we do just say we adore you, Lord God. We stand in awe of you, Lord God, and we choose, even in the midst of this time, Lord God, to center ourselves and to focus on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who has loved us enough to die for us, Lord God. So, Lord, we just thank you. We say you are worthy of all our praise, Lord God. You are worthy of our adoration. We love you, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, we just give ourselves afresh to you. In Jesus' name.
in John 1, it says this. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The Lord Jesus has paid the price for you. He has given us grace upon grace. And just as we're um, coming to sing the next song in your um, households or if you're at home, I just want you all to just thank God for one thing in your life that God has given you that you know is a direct consequence of you knowing him and being loved by him. He has given us grace upon grace. We deserve to go to hell forever and ever. And instead, we are going to go to glory and be with him forever and ever. And we get the joy of discovering the fullness of God in our lives. So children, this is for you as well, to just say those things that you're thankful for in your life. We all have things that we are thankful for. So we're just going to do that quickly and then we're going to head into the next song.
Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for the joy of knowing you. Thank you that we're able to approach you in worship. Lord, we are so amazed that you would come to earth to rescue us, to set us free. And we're so um, just joyful that we get to know you in our lives. And we just praise you and thank you for all of your goodness. Amen. morning to everybody, to anyone who's arrived since we started. It's really nice to have you here this morning. Um, we are having a preach today from Ray. He is recorded because um, obviously the numbers are quite high around here and he is a little bit older of the slightly older generation. So he is um, going to be uh, preaching to us via a video in a minute, but we've got some notices first. Firstly, I thought it would be really good if we just pray for people. We have um, people in the church have um, contracted COVID, not from coming to church, but from um, different parts of uh, their life, as it's everywhere. They have um, contracted it. And I just think it would be really good as a family of believers to just keep praying for people who we know are unwell. Um, so it would be really good if we could just have a moment of, of prayer now. So we're going to pray for Grant, um, particularly. He um, is, in, is still in hospital, and he's feeling absolutely dreadful, as you would expect. Um, but we are really grateful to God because actually God has really met with him during this time. But can we just pray that actually his recovery is very quick, that the Lord would just step in and get him home quickly and pray for Rachel and the boys. And there's also other people in the church who are um, unwell at the moment. So if we could just pray. Should we um, pray together? Kids, do you want to stand up as well? And we'll all pray together and um, let's Let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you so much that when we read about your life here on earth, you healed people and you set them free. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the joy of knowing that you're a God who steps in and heals. And we just pray for Grant. Lord Jesus, I pray right now you would miraculously just step in and bring healing to his body. Lord, I pray that he would go home next week. I pray, Lord Jesus, that they can take his oxygen right off. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we have many stories of you breaking in and healing people. Lord Jesus, I just keep remembering like little Luke when he was poorly just came straight off a ventilator and came home Lord with not much in not in much in the middle and Lord Jesus we claim that for Grant as well that they will be able to get him off his oxygen that he'll be able to go home and be with his family Lord Jesus we pray for Rachel and the boys strengthen them and encourage them Lord Jesus I pray that in this time you would draw them all really close to you and Lord we pray for people in the church who are either suffering uh, from COVID at the moment or who are recovering from it. Lord, we pray for miraculous healing, Lord Jesus, on their bodies. Lord Jesus, we pray that as a family of believers, your hand of protection would be on us. We pray for people who are vulnerable in the church. Lord God, would you keep them safe? Would you have your hands of protection on them? But Lord Jesus, we thank you most of all that we know that one day you are going to make everything new. Lord Jesus, that in heaven there will be no illnesses, there will be no sicknesses, and that we have the great joy of knowing that we will go and be with you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, we have a week of prayer starting today. There's um, family prayer packs available at the service today, but you can also collect um, little prayer packs from the church from Monday to Friday, 9 to 3. Um, you can just come in and collect them. Obviously, you will need to wear a mask when you enter the building. Um, we have a Zoom prayer meeting on Tuesday at 7.30. Uh, actually, um, Dunk Purvey did um, some Zoom prayer meetings for Grant. And it was, it, I was a bit sceptical about what it would be like. And it was actually really good to just be able to see everybody's faces and just pray for people and feel as a community of believers together that we are praying together and asking God together. So I would encourage you to be part of that. The link for it will be on the weekly email um, we also have on Thursday, we have Simply Worship, which will be live streamed at eight o'clock. And again, can I just really encourage us as a family of believers to connect with that and to spend time worshiping and praising God. On the 8th of February, it is an exciting day because it is the church's 40th birthday or around then it's the church's 40th birthday I'm not exactly sure if it is exactly the 8th of February but we are going to have because of the truly exciting times that we are in we're going to have a 40th birthday 
quiz. Hurrah, I hear you all say. So that will be on the uh, 8th, and it will be... Now, I think that says 7.30, but I might be wrong. But anyway, there'll be a Zoom quiz at 7.30. Um, the last quiz was absolutely hilarious because it was like, um, Dennis and Sheila said it was like being on Gogglebox. And it actually was like being on Gogglebox. It was absolutely hilarious. People hadn't turned their microphones off. You could hear all the conversations. It's brilliant. So uh, that's on the 8th. So let's make a priority as well for that as a family of believers. So we're going to listen to Ray now, and he's just going to be talking to us um, for some of the reflections from his life. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Raymond Bodkin, and I've been a member of this church since it began nearly 40 years ago in February 1981. That's actually probably before some of you were born. <laughs> I'm so sorry I can't be with you this morning personally, but uh, Ruth and I as octogenarians are self-isolating. And so I have the uh, joy of speaking to you on Zoom, which is obviously God's gift to us during this pandemic. So I has asked me to share with you a few more things I have learned along the way of my spiritual journey. Last time, you may remember, I shared about new birth. We all must be born again. Daily Bible reading, spending time with our father and listening to him. Prayer and practicing the presence spending time with our Father and talking to him and listening to what he has to say to us. We thought about water and spirit baptism, word, spirit and worship, family, friendship uh, and fellowship. This morning, let us start by thinking about marriage. God our Father has blessed us as his children with the wonderful gift of marriage. It was his idea. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them handy, to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father, God says, and mother, and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Paul has a lot to say about marriage, actually, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but we don't have time to read that this morning. But I would encourage you to read it at home and uh, or in your home where you may well be at this particular moment of time. Just go through it and see what Paul has to say on this so important subject. In that chapter, Paul actually indicates that uh, marriage may not be for everyone. For those who are not married, like himself, he tells us that God gives to them the gift of celibacy and they can develop the fruit of self-control, a gift given by the Holy Spirit and a fruit nurtured by the Holy Spirit. I have learned along the way how important it is for us as a church family to love, support and honour those amongst us who are single, widowed or divorced. In this post-Christian age, when marriage is constantly being questioned and undermined, I believe that John Stott's definition of marriage is the one we must hold to. Marriage, he says, is an exclusive heterosexual covenant between one man and one woman, a man and his wife, ordained and sealed by God, preceded by a public leaving of parents, leave, consummated in sexual union, they will become one flesh, issuing in a permanent, mutually supported partnership, cleave, normally crowned with the gift of children. Genesis has much more to say about marriage. At the beginning of creation, the father explained to us three reasons why he ordained marriage. The first is in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 where he talked about companionship. It says this, it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Marriage is a partnership and our partner should be our best friend. Secondly, marriage was ordained for chastity as we see in chapter two and verse 24. The man will be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Marriage is a commitment. It's an intimate relationship between 
two people, a man and his wife, and no one else. The relationship is expressed in unselfish and sacrificial love. And then thirdly, after companionship and chastity, it is, as we find in Genesis 1, 28, about children. God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. It has always been my prayer that God would gift our married couples with children who they will teach and discipline in a loving family environment. Just a word for any young people who are listening to me at the moment. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. A friend of mine once said, if you stand on a table, it is much easier to pull someone down than it is to pull them up. That's so true in mixed marriages. The unbeliever can so easily pull the believer away from their savior. God has a lot to say actually in the Old Testament about mixed marriages. And so it is terribly important. And it's something I have learned for believers to choose a believing partner and for the church to have marriage preparation classes and also marriage enhancement classes. The writer to Ecclesiastes says this, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That's in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 12. Jesus must always be the third party in a Christian marriage. The eighth thing I have learnt is that God provides. God is known by many names in scripture. Jehovah is one of them. Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. This name is actually found in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 14. You'll remember that Abraham is tested by God and told to sacrifice his son. In obedience, Abraham begins to prepare the sacrifice. Isaac, his son, says to him, Father, where's the lamb? Abraham's reply is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I have learned along the way that Father is an amazing provider. He has provided and protected me in incredible ways during the war years, 19, in the 1930s, which most of you won't remember. And Ruth and I are incredibly thankful to God for his provision, provision to us during our 56 years of married life. We've always had a roof over our head, food on the table, money in the bank, friends in the church, good health, and children who love the Lord. I've learned a lot about money too, but I won't say anything about that at this stage, but on the 1st of January every year, I prepare us a family budget to ensure that we don't spend more than we actually have coming in. God and I have to work on this together. If you want to learn a bit more about budgeting, then do give me a ring and we can have a chat about it perhaps on the phone. However, let me just share with you two amazing provisions that I have experienced. When I was the accountant at Scripture Union, I couldn't afford a car. And every weekend, a friend from the Christian Brethren Assembly that we attended used to just drop his car outside of our door so that we could do our shopping and take our children out for the afternoon. A few months later, one evening a knock um, came to the door and a man from the church said to me, I've recently bought a new car, would you like my old one? And I said to him, well, how much will it cost? He said, well, it won't cost you anything, I'm giving it to you free, although you will have to pay the insurance. So this was an amazing provision um, from God, and uh, I really appreciated his generosity. When I left Scripture Union and rejoined British Bakeries, which is part of the Rankovis MacDougall group, I was given a company car. And so our green Morris Minor, which we didn't need anymore, was handed on to a friend who was a youth worker in a church in Reigate. 
he, like us, was not able to afford a car. A few years later, we were down at Horden Court, a Christian conference centre in Exmouth. The leader that week, on the first evening, the Saturday evening, turned and said, tell someone next to you how God has blessed you recently. The lady next to Ruth said, I'm a missionary on furlough, and a couple have just given me a car so that I can visit my supporters. <laughs> yes, you've guessed it. It was our green Morris Minor. In God's providence, what comes around, goes around. Many years later, I was offered a regional job with British bakeries. This would mean moving to Crawley and traveling all over the south of England. One lunchtime we were discussing this as a family and our eldest son, Timothy said, we love it here. Do we really have to move? The fellowship has only just started and this is where all our friends are. Ruth and I really felt this was a word from the Lord and much to the amazement of my regional director, I handed in my notice and accepted consequential redundancy. I had no view, any job in view at that particular moment of time. But when I shared our decision with Paul Endersby and Jeff Shearn, they said, well, you know, the church could afford to pay you three days a week. Why don't you start working for the fellowship? I immediately agreed. Just a few days later, I got a call from the managing director of Kingsway Publications, offering me three days consultancy work. A few years later, I actually became a full-time director of that company, but God provided me with six days work. And you know, the day I actually started to lead the fellowship on the 5th of April, 1983, my reading was from Acts chapter 20, which includes verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. Do you remember the last time I spoke about the things I've learned along the way? I mentioned how God speaks to us from his word. This is just another of those many examples which I have noted in my Bible. Yes, it is true. The Lord will provide. And both Ruth and I have experienced his amazing provision over all the years. As I say, we find that actually in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 14. The next lesson is about mentoring and discipling. It was not long before I learned the importance of listening to the counsel of wise men. Men I've already mentioned and previously, and particularly, I suppose, with regards to our church, to Terry Virgo. He taught us a great deal about grace, the things of the spirit, Christian values, church life, and the importance and mirrored for us, servant leadership. Meeting regularly with someone you trust and who is committed to you is so valuable whatever your age may be. See, people like this are, are a sounding board and they ensure that you're leading a godly life. Many years ago, Dave King from Paul prophesied over me that like Paul in the Bible, God would give me my Timothys. Having been mentored, it has been my great joy to mentor others. Terry Virgo has recently pointed out that the role of leaders is not simply to nurture believers, but do what Jesus commissioned us to do, to make disciples. People who would leave church on Sunday morning and become salt and light in the world, in their places of work, at school, wherever it may be, during the next six days. Just see what happened in Acts chapter 8 verses 1 and 4 when people were actually spread out as a consequence of persecution and the gospel was shed and spread in amazing ways. When this was, church was planted 40 years ago, 
people from other churches and people from no churches at all began to ask to join us. As leaders, Paul, Jeff and myself realised we all needed to sing from the same hymn sheet. So um, because we'd come from different backgrounds, and many had not actually experienced what was now being called the charismatic movement. As a conference, as a consequence, many people had different views, spiritual views, theological views. We felt it was important for people wanting to join the fellowship to know what we believed and accepted biblically. I therefore designed a seven week foundation course, which everyone irrespective of their church background was required to go through before coming into membership. This ensured that we were all in agreement about what we believed. The Holy Spirit and baptism with the Holy Spirit were two very important aspects of this course. And many people were filled with the Holy Spirit during that time and went on to grow and to move in spiritual gifts and to develop spiritual fruits in their lives. This was new ground for many of us and discipling was and still is an essential part to our own and to the growth of our individual churches. Solomon says this in Proverbs, listen to advice and accept instruction. Paul says to Timothy, the things you have heard me say, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. The one from Proverbs is Proverbs 19.20 and the text for Timothy is from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. The tenth thing that I've learned along the way is the importance of building a good library of Christian books and music. Duncan, you may remember, mentioned this last week. As a young Christian, I read many missionary biographies and autobiographies. Over the years, I purchased many of the commentaries in the Bible Speaks Today series. I bought all the Lion handbooks, many of the IVF publications, and some are books written by the saints of old. These have been part of my spiritual diet. Working for Scripture Union and Kingsway Publications, I was also able to obtain books written by today's authors. And many of these books are now actually in the church library, which are available to you. 28 years ago, I commenced producing The Hymn Makers, a series of albums for, for Kingsway Music. It actually contains now 25 albums, and we've recorded 306 psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They actually cover four whole centuries, right the way through from Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley's, to the new hymn makers today of Graham Kendrick, Stuart Townend and the Gettys. I use these albums every day in my spiritual time with God. It's part of my act of worship before I actually come to look at God's word and to see what he has to say to me. I would also encourage you actually to take notes of the sermons you listen to and perhaps record them on your computer for future study and reference. This is what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Over the years, I've also learned a lot about witnessing. One of my favorite characters in the Bible, uh, I, I do have many, actually is Andrew. Do you know, every time he appears in scripture, he's introducing people to Jesus. He starts with his own brother. We often think if it had not been for Peter, we would never have known about Andrew. But actually the reverse is true. We know about Peter, because the first thing Andrew did, the word the Bible says, was to find his brother Simon Peter and tell him, we have seen the Messiah, we have seen the Christ. It's Andrew, you will remember, who introduced a little boy to Jesus and his lunch fed 5,000 people, plus 
women and children. So 5,000 men, women and children were fed with that little boy's lunch. It was Andrew who with Philip introduced the Greeks to Jesus. So he was the person who was constantly introducing people to Jesus. You see why I love Andrew? Witnessing will often start with a family as it did there with Andrew. I remember after I became a Christian, I took my mum to a Youth of Christ meeting in Eastbourne Town Hall. And to my amazement, I shouldn't have been amazed, but to my amazement, when the appeal was made at the end, mum actually walked down to the front and gave her life to Jesus. When we got home, my dad actually said that a few days earlier, he had committed his life to Jesus, simply by reading some Bible notes that I had left laying on the side, by the side of his bed. I have to admit, I'm not good at starting conversations that open up the opportunity about speaking and introducing Jesus. But if someone raises a question, then I'm away. Often during my morning quiet time, I say, Lord, if you want me to introduce you to someone today, let me know, because I do believe that the fields are white or ready for harvest. The second thing I have to admit is I don't like to buttonhole people. I want the Lord to point me to people who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, people in whom the Holy Spirit has already started to work. They are the people that are most likely to make a commitment and become disciples of Jesus. For me, a key verse is 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. It says this, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and with respect. Finally, let me say something about leadership and accountability. When you have a leadership role, it is so important both for you and for the people you serve that you are accountable to someone else. In our church, it's an apostle. We had oversight initially as a fellowship from Edmund Heddle, then from Peter Fenwick, and finally from Terry Virgo, the leader of New Frontiers. Terry taught us, and I have learned, that Jesus is the model for leadership. Jesus acted and spoke to create disciples who would establish his kingdom in this world. Jesus' goal was to make disciples who would be salt and light in the world, making disciples themselves. Christian leaders should point people to Jesus and not to themselves. They should help and encourage people to become worshippers, serving, honouring and loving God and all of his creation. The Bible is a Christian leader's roadmap for the journey he and all of us are on. He is a pastor and a teacher and sometimes has other gifts, spiritual gifts as well. God's heart is that everyone should be saved. A Christian leader must have the same heart, longing to see people saved, coming to know Jesus as their saviour. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, I have not come to be served, but to serve. A Christian leader must have a servant heart. Jesus said in John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. A Christian leader, whether a church leader or a life group leader or leader in any area, must be a shepherd of the flock, guiding them into paths of righteousness, leading them into green pastures and quiet waters, being with them in the good times and the difficult times. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. A Christian leader often has to make sacrifices. And I've learned leadership in a church is not an easy role. I've even got the scars to show it. But Hebrews says this, and I would encourage you 
just to think about this verse, Hebrews 13 and verse 17, as members of this amazing church that we are part of. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would not be an advantage to you. Six more things I have learnt along the way during this amazing journey that I've been on with Jesus over the last 70 years. We've thought about marriage, the Lord who provides, Jehovah Jireh, mentoring and discipling, reading and writing, witnessing and leadership and accountability. I hope you found these thoughts interesting. I trust that God will bless you as you continue on your spiritual journey. Let me just pray for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Peace is the Father's gift to each one of us. It's his legacy. Jesus said, I leave my peace with you. So this morning, receive that peace, particularly in these difficult times. Amen. We're now going to join together in singing a hymn that is very much part of my life, How Great Thou Art.
It's been wonderful to be together this morning, um, and we just really pray that you would just know God with you at this time. You know, I was thinking this week, I was thinking, oh, lockdown number three, or whatever number it is, I don't know, we've lost count, haven't we? But um, I was thinking, oh, it just feels like such a waste of time. And I just felt God really challenged me on that, that actually God has allowed this to happen and he has a plan and a purpose in it. And actually as believers, we need to be seeking God for what he is wanting to do with us during this time, but also looking like uh, Ray said, for those opportunities to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus with people um, in whatever way we can. So we just pray that the Lord would be with you this week, that he would strengthen you and encourage you. Um, and can I just encourage you to look out for each other, to be calling each other, messaging each other, and just caring for each other and looking after your neighbours and just being people who are salt and light in our community. But it's been great to be together. The Lord bless you this week. Um, Sorry if uh, you came and you brought communion to stuff. We just decided we wouldn't do communion um, because the um, infection rates are so high. We didn't think it was a great idea for everyone to be taking their masks off and shoving things in their mouths. So we decided not to do uh, communion this week. But just encourage you as a family um, to do communion this week and to remember the goodness of God. Thank you for being together and the Lord bless you.